Hi, I'm Eric Johnson and welcome to the Thrower X podcast. Today's guest is an absolute superstar, pound for pound, likely the greatest shot putter existing on the planet today. He is a super cool young dude and I really love this interview. This next clip, we will talk a little bit and so be sure to check it out. I want to say a huge congratulations. What's amazing is that it was fifth at the greatest shot put Olympics ever. The fact is you PR in the qualifying, you PR in the final. So you throw 21-41 in the final. That throw would have won like all kinds of Olympic games. Congratulations on fifth place at the greatest Olympic shot put final in history, you kind of covered some of the training, but generally, you know, what's the, you guys obviously, do you attribute the success towards the end of the season? Um, was it, you know, part of my job as a coach is always, and I've had a lot of good luck with that. You know, you set a plan. This is when you're trying to throw far. I kind of do block periods, you know, where it's like I'm trying to hit multiple peaks. It's not just yeah. the old school linear thing. So how does your year look? And then, of course, you peaked at the games, you know, and, and again, I want to say you were fifth in qualifying and fifth in the final. So, okay. you know, you brought it, you you had, I think, like, you know, it's a pressure environment. You open up with a 2084, the second round, you hit the you know, your PR at the time is 2011. So how is that, you know, when you go in knowing, well, my PR is only 2011, the auto queue is 20, 21, 21, and you yeah. go 21, 25, you're like, sweet, I'm in. And I'm going to come back the next day. How, how was, you know, how did that feel? Like you came in when you hit the 2084, you're like, yeah, I feel good today. Was that like, um, when I hit 2084, I kind of went like, wow, that was easy. And so then I was like, this could be fun. Um, and I knew, to, I, I, well, I thought to myself, I actually don't know the statistics, but I was like, 284 is not enough. Um, and I, I always say to myself, I don't actually necessarily, I'm not too concerned about how I, how I do in the Olympics from a position perspective. I just kind of want to PR. And so, you know, when I hit 21, 25, I was, I was so happy. I don't, I didn't even process that that was an automatic qualification. I completely forgot the numbers of, I was super happy. And I remember asking the South African guy, their car, I said, what's the, what is, cause I saw it hit the white line. And I didn't know if it was 21, 30. And I, you know, so much of that qualification is a, is a blur. And mm. so um, I just remember feeling super happy and just feeling like, wow, you know, uh, that, that was kind of, uh, I don't want to lie to you, but uh, the emotion around that, the 21-25 in the qualification um, was, and coming fifth overall was almost more um, emotive than coming fifth overall. The coming fifth overall in the final was fantastic. You know, PRE and throwing 21-41 was amazing. Um, but the emotion and the sort of, I was even, I was surprised from, you know, doing that, but also not surprised. It's difficult to explain, but it was just the emotion from going from sort of, not expecting too much to then being there going, wow, you know, I just came fifth in the qualification. That's, that's huge. Yeah. it's um, massive. And, then to, and, and then to do it, you know, in the final as well, it was of course the cherry on top, but just, I remember coming back to my phone and just seeing uh, my parents, <laughs> they, they, they were having a sort of uh, a, a meeting with my other family members and there were pictures of them on the group crying. And I think that was just uh, for me, just huge. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome, man. Now you, uh, obviously that said, now, what are you thinking when you come back the next day in the final, you know, and, uh, you, you, you open up again with 2085 on the final and how did, and then, you know, it wasn't until the final, obviously like the final, you know, three throws that you go 2140 and 2141. You know, you had two 2140s, which was better than Romani. He, he, he hit a 2188 on that first throw. Yeah. And, you know, that, that held him for fourth. But, I mean, at this point, you're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Darlin Romani. I mean, Darlin Romani is an, like a beast, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that guy is huge, right? Like, you've competed against him. I, I, the guy is just traps, chest. I mean, <laughs> he is just giant. Like a bull. Um, 
Yeah. yeah. Like, so what's it like, like, like what goes through your head at this point when you're there and it's like, you're punching it out with Romani. I mean, and all these guys, it's just like, um, and you know, at this point too, you're, you know, um, Walsh opened up at 2109. Right. And then he, of mm-hmm. course he, 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 he hits some better throws, but his, even to put in perspective, like his 2247 was the Olympic record before 2016. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like the, this, this was just like incredible competition. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going on and on, but <laughs> no, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. <laughs> so, so how do you, you know, you, you, you hit the 2085. Do you feel like, do you feel any pressure at that point? Do you feel like that's going to hold up to get you into the top eight so you can get three more? Or, you know, yeah, at, at that point, at that point, I definitely didn't think it was going to be enough to get me into uh, in top eight. So I was kind of still still chasing it. Um, but in the same breath, you know, realizing it's probably not going to be enough. I still have to be very active in, in, in trying, but also being relaxed enough so you don't mess up the timing and the throw. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was, a, I was a bit disappointed. I was a bit worried, um, obviously, after my third throw. And it wasn't, you know, I thought all 2085 because I, I don't know if that would have qualified for the final 2085. I don't know what, the, you know, from what I, what I see from looking at the results, I think that mm-hmm. that did put you in eighth, right? Okay. So I think, oh, sorry, you know, ex- exactly. So I was, I th- yeah. think I was probably, I was the last to qualify into that final. I remember. Um, and then uh, the South African, Carl Blichner threw 21 in his third throw. And that was when I was like, I, this can't happen, you know. So <laughs> that that fired me up, and I re- I remember um, I remember saying to him because so I'm not a big coffee drinker, and obviously the Italians don't like that about me. But I now I've got into the habit of having um, like a triple espresso before the before I throw it. Kind of it it, it works yeah. really well because I'm not like used to the caffeine and whatnot. And so anyway, so I've been doing that, and then of course the morning of the Olympic final was the only time ever in a competition where there has not been coffee. They were running late, and I remember thinking to myself, I remember thinking, that's good, you know. Of course, it will happen today. But I thought, like, you know, you're going to do it without it. And I remember thinking that and going, in and I thought, I'm not going to let this affect me. And uh, anyway, and then I remember off that third throw when when Carl uh, threw 21, he said to me, he's like, do you want a Red Bull? So I was like, no. I was like, do you have a coffee? he's like, I do have a coffee. So he pulls out this coffee and, uh, you know, we, we share that in between the, the, the next three throws. And that was kind of, you know, I don't know if I can attribute it solely to the coffee, but um, it definitely put me in a good focus spot. And uh, it kind of took off from there. And I think that's one of the things that I also love the most about that Olympic final is to do it with Kyle, not that he's South African, but, you know, this young, really good thrower. Yeah. But like, you know, we were two, I remember I trained with him for two months when I was in Joburg with the other coach. He trained with my previous coach. Mm. With these two guys that everyone, you know, no one spoke about us leading into the games. And, you know, here we are in the Olympic final, definitely top eight, you know, sharing a coffee before the final three throws and just thinking like, we're just two guys out here having fun. And uh, I think that that for me was such a beautiful moment of, of the, the competition. And it helped keep me calm because I felt like, you know, we had another training session um, and have fun with it and that really that, that helped me a lot that's awesome um, but uh, yeah, sorry so I don't know I, I don't know if I answered your question I'm also getting a bit sidetracked <laughs> no 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 that's great it's love I love it it's cool it's cool insights for sure but yeah you know so when you go in you hit the PRs and I mean you're just thinking okay you made it in eighth and now mm-hmm. you're thinking all right what do you what's where's your mindset oh, Are right. you just and what is coach Paolo what's he saying to you so I remember specifically, he said it to me after the 2086 in the, in the qualifications and also the 2080 um, uh, and, and also going into the, the fourth round. What I do when I come out the back of the circle, um, the arm, I don't keep the arm sort of level. Um, and so when I dip at the hip, the arm goes up. So he said to me, he said, keep your arm level coming out the back. And so that is the only thing I was thinking in that fourth throw. And then when I went 29, 40, I thought, ooh, I thought that felt good. Um, and then again, then do, going after it again, I focused on the same thing and hit the 2141. And then in the sixth throw, I remember thinking it's all or nothing. And um, I pushed super hard, but I messed up the timing. And I think if I'd, if I'd kept the timing with the speed that I came out of the back of the circle with, um, it could have been something, could have been something special. No, that's awesome. And, uh, but it was, yeah, it was, it was perfect. I, you know, I couldn't be upset. <laughs> I couldn't yeah. be upset. No, that's, that's amazing. Again, you just kind of kept the peak going after that, right? You were just on a real hot streak. And I think you won the Italian club championship and finished with another PR. Like you had two more big PRs, a 2163 and then a 2166. 
you're like, a, you know, a consistent 70 foot guy at this point. That is a long ways from just a few years ago where you're barely throw you throw 19 meters one time. Yeah. Um, so, so this being said, you know, the, the American, I think partly why I think America is so good in the shot is because these guys are just freaks. They're, they're all Peyton Otterdahl. He's a monster. The guy's strong mm. as can be. Krauser's yeah. a big, fast, really strong guy. Like he's incredible. Joe, Co did you see Joe Kovacs with last year? They made it on, he had like an 870 oh, squat for four. I mean, it's Crazy. just like, he's literally got to be one of the strongest dudes on the planet. Like, I mean, Agreed. he's, he, he's an, he's incredible. So yeah. that being said, what are your strength levels? Everybody wants to know this stuff. Everybody yeah, wants yeah. to know what do you bench? What do you squat? Like, <laughs> where, where are you? Um, it's, yeah, so I, I can't enjoy sharing these numbers because it's, uh, I think it speaks to the beauty of technique. Um, prior to the Olympic Games, my PR was 150 kgs for two in the bench press. Wow. Um, but now, so now I've gone up to 160 kgs for two. <laughs> um, I have done in the squat, I haven't gone over 200 for two. Uh, we only kind of do uh, quarter squats as well. So I haven't gone over 200. Okay. Um, and then snatch um i've only gone up to 90 kgs for wow. three a 90 um, kilo snatch for three yeah and you can throw 70 feet in the shot this is unbelievable man <laughs> um i'm just trying to think those are kind of the big markers we don't deadlift um, okay clean squat do you do jerks uh we do a behind the neck jerk um but it's kind of it's not it's not a joke you, you don't we don't use our legs it's more just we stand on our toes just to get that that rhythm um mm. and i've gone up to 100 100 kgs on that mm. behind the neck okay, so, kind of jerk yeah all right um, but but those are kind of the only ones that i can think that are of any interest especially for the big the big uh, sort of three so so what now you i heard you earlier say you throw one day it sounds like you lift one day and you do a circuit so that was that was specifically during COVID because obviously we had no like access oh, to physiotherapists okay. and whatnot. Gotcha, um, gotcha. And at, in, in that period, I think the heaviest I went on the bench was 115, which is just crazy. Wow. Yes. Uh, but at, at, at but at that time, I hadn't had really consistent weight training, so it was like for me it was still a bit of a, a hassle. Okay. But um, anyway, but that was yeah, that was then. And um, but now, so it, it depends on what part of the season we're in. But we kind of do like a when we're on a training camp, we'll do a two one two uh two one two one one two one um, two one one what is that so so we'll do uh throws weightlifting on a monday uh okay. throws throws on a tuesday um throws and weightlift uh we'll do field work and weightlifting on a wednesday okay so what's field work field work so we'll go down to like obviously a, a stadium we'll do some 60 meter like rhythmic runs we'll do some hurdle work um, overhead throws, front throws, um, jumps into the sand pit. Uh, so it's kind of like it's an active recovery because my coach doesn't like to put three throwing days together. Hmm. Um, yeah. Especially because, especially you know, it's on on a training camp. It's quite it's quite intense. It's you know we've just finished one now and it's you kind of walk out and you think flip. Well, that's been like that's been a month and you and I don't know where it's gone. It's <laughs> it's it's crazy. You know, I, I nap between the sessions. You wake up, you eat, you, and you're on to the next one. You know, and then you have supper. You go back home. You right. sleep, and you do it again the next day. So it's really busy. So that's kind of so that's you know Wednesday is is, is field work, weightlifting in the afternoon. Um, Friday, Thursday is just wait, uh, just the throws in the morning. Okay. Friday is throw in the morning, uh, weightlifting afternoon. And then Saturday's weightlifting. Um, so that's kind of how it's set up for, for, our, for our training camps. And that is similar to last year, but a little bit different. There was a few tweaks. Um, uh, I can't remember. I must look at the programs. But it's, it's kind of, that's the principle that uh, my coach okay. kind of adopts. And then how, how um, much rest do you do after a training camp? Is it like a download week? Do you completely leave everything off? Is it everything lighter? Like, how does that look? So we'll do a three a three week uh, like I've just described to you now, and then our fourth week of that training camp will be uh, th just throws Monday, throws Tuesday, f 
field work on a Wednesday. So hopefully you enjoyed today's excerpt from our interview. Please stay tuned. We will be showing the complete interview in the coming weeks. Awesome guy. Lots of great discussion coming. So be sure to check it out. See you then. Everybody, thanks for attending or watching our Thrower X podcast brought to you by Airte Throws Nation. If you are a thrower coach looking to improve your throws, looking how to understand the speed and the technical complexity, check out our six pillar training system, the Throwing Chain Reaction. Link is in the description. We'll see you on the next cast.